Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome on behalf of the Rockwell Museum and Card Carrying Books and Gifts, um, and of course our panelists as well, which you'll hear more about um, as we as we go on. But we're here tonight for Believe Me, a live discussion with Jacqueline Friedman, Bonnie Claremont, and Sarah Deer. I'm Kate Swanson. I'm representing the Rockwell Museum. I'm the interpretation and public engagement educator. So tonight, these three women, these powerhouses here, will discuss themes from the pivotal new book, Believe Me, How Trusting Women Can Change the World, which asks a very important question, asks a lot of questions, but specifically this one is very important. What if we structured our society as if women's lived experiences and insights were just as important and reliable as men's? What a concept, right? Despite the seemingly endless pivots and rethinkings we've been blessed with in 2020, it's an honor for me to be here with these women still working in service of the Rockwell Museum's annual theme this year, which is Advancing Women. Over the course of this year, we've been um, asking women artists and scholars to speak, play music, produce installations, teach our programs, um, and we've presented lots of great exhibitions by women artists. We chose this theme as an active response to the underrepresentation of women on the walls of museums and art galleries and in honor of the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote in 1920. We know that white women who earned the right to vote, who granted the right to vote in, uh, 100 years ago, did not do so in a vacuum, but were very indebted to the abolition movement, as well as to the Haudenosaunee women whose ancestral lands the Rockwell and card carrying occupy. We're indebted to the legacy of African American and Native American women in these in these struggles and going forward. Believe Me is one of the most inclusive feminist books I have ever gotten my hands on and I'm so grateful to Jacqueline and her co-editor Jessica Valenti for ensuring that women are not seen as a monolith. So let me tell you about some of these individual women that you'll be hearing from tonight. Jacqueline is the co-editor co of Believe Me, How Trusting Women Can Change the World, <laughs> and a popular, Jacqueline is also a popular speaker, opinion writer, and the author of three books, including the seminal work on consent, yes means yes, visions of sexual female power, and a world without rape. Jacqueline is also the host of Unscrewed, named a best sex podcast by both Marie, Marie Claire and Esquire. Bonnie Claremont, who is Ho Chunk, and here with us, not from South Dakota today, but from Minnesota. Um, she's a citizen of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, resides in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she's employed with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute as the Victim Advocacy Program Specialist. She provides training and technical assistance to tribal communities to better enable them to respond to violence against Native women. Bonnie has worked for more than 30 years as an advocate for victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, and sexual harassment as well as for children exposed to violence. So thank you for that work, Bonnie. And Sarah Deer um, is a professor at the University of Kansas. She's a 2014 MacArthur Fellow and has received recognition from the US Department of Justice and the American Bar Association for her work to end violence against Native women. So thank you for that work as well, Sarah. Um, and for now, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And I want to just thank the Rockwell Museum and Card Carrying Books and Gifts for hosting us. Uh, as I was saying before, I think people came in, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to reach beyond geography and to also bring you some of our phenomenal contributors that we could, would never have been able to uh, bring in person as well. So I'm thrilled to be here just facilitating you hearing from Bonnie and Sarah mostly. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about why Jessica and I made Believe Me, and I'm going to read a little bit from my essay in it just to give you some grounding in what the book is about overall, and then we're going to turn it over to Sarah and Bonnie. Um, so Jessica and I made Yes Means Yes together what feels like one million years ago, but which actually was uh, in the beginning of 2009. And as we were looking at the anniversary, the 10 year anniversary coming up on us of that book, we were really thinking about um, what was the legacy of Yes Means Yes and how we could honor it in that 10 year anniversary. And, and one, some of the lessons we learned from Yes Means Yes is that people really need a positive vision to reach toward, not just something to be against. Uh, people really respond well to being pushed a little, right? Like to finding that 
that that idea that is just on the cusp of being mainstreamed into public con consciousness and to opening their minds up to it um, from a bunch of diff really brilliant feminist perspectives. And, and that was really some of the magic of Yes Means Yes. And so we were talking about those components. We were, we were talking about, you know, what, what's that idea now? Um, yes Means Yes has been successful behind, beyond our wildest dreams. Um, and we didn't want to just rehash the ideas in it um, because a lot of them have become mainstream. And when we started talking about that, we really started talking about how the idea that women are both credible and important is really where that tension point is right now. I those both those components are important and are crucial to the, our definition of belief in women, right? So believe women doesn't mean, and Jessica's essay addresses this brilliantly. It doesn't mean believe all women about everything all the time, because of course, that's bonkers, and no one is proposing that. Um, <laughs> what it really means is, what if we restructured our culture so that women were treated as de facto as credible and as important as we treat men. And both of those, those ideas, credible and important, are equally critical because we just need to look at examples like Christine Blasey Ford to, to understand why, right? Everybody believed her. The president of the United States tweeted out that she seemed credible, uh, but nobody, in the end, the people who had the power, not enough of them deemed her important enough uh, to do anything about what she was saying. So we need both of those factors, credibility and importance. And so we thought about who we wanted to hear from uh, on that theme, who we really felt could push our, our own thinking and everyone else's thinking forward on this. Um, Sarah was one of my first people on my list and, and I'm sure we'll hear the story about how the two of them got involved uh, when they speak. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna, to flesh out that idea a little with the an excerpt from my own essay, uh, which is called The Cost of Disbelieving. Here it is. The truth underlying the public health crisis of women's believability is even worse than it looks. That's because social researchers have long demonstrated that it's not just that we hold women to much higher standards than we do men before we believe them, it's more perverse than that. We prefer not finding women credible. As a culture, we hate to believe women and we penalize them for forcing us to do so. In other words, as women's credibility increases, especially in ways that defy gender norms, their social likability decreases. They become shrill, bitches, ball busters, too aggressive, too bossy, such intolerable know-it-alls. And of course, across intersections of oppression like race and class and disability, those those impacts are amplified. I, I used to think about Elizabeth Warren when I read that section and now I'm thinking about Kamala Harris and the VP narrative around her and how unlikable she is, right, because she was a credible uh, candidate for president. Um, it's not enough that we demand women clear a much higher bar than men do to prove their trustworthiness. We're mad when they manage to succeed anyway and we're all paying the price for that anger. Some of the losses are literally immeasurable. I know of no woman who doesn't house inside her the nagging feeling that maybe what she has to say is not that important or will cause too much trouble or will put her in danger. I know of no woman who has not at least some of the time allowed that feeling to prevail, to smother her impulse to speak. I'm haunted by the losses to humanity those infinite silences represent. What inventions and innovations are we suffering without? What tragedies proceeded unprevented? What kindness and community are we starving for that we could be sustained by had we not silenced ourselves? For that matter, what offerings could we be benefiting from if women simply didn't have to work so hard to prove our credibility to ourselves and others? How many hours and days of our lives have been stolen from us in this way? And yet still today, how many women does it take to overcome the credibility of one man? It took 60 for sexual abuse allegations to become credible against Bill Cosby. For Harvey Weinstein to be credibly accused of sexual harassment and assault, the number is more like 80. For some, we have yet to find the number. Over a dozen have accused Donald Trump of sexual assault, and he is still the president of the United States. 
women ourselves are far from immune to gender disbelief. In one 2015 Harvard study, almost a quarter of the teen girls preferred male political leaders over female ones. Only 8% of the girls expressed a bias in favor of women leaders. Ultimately, the systemic disbelief of women is less about actually seeing women as untrustworthy and more about fearing what happens if we're able to step into our full power. Not that this distinction matters in practice. Do anti-abortion activists really think women are so easily duped by doctors? Or is it just more convenient for them to blame doctors and posit women as frail-minded and in need of protection than it is to admit that they just want to dictate what we do with our own bodies? Do we not believe that trans women know themselves better than we do? Or do we just fear how destabilizing it is to admit that gender is a construct? The damage is done either way. But it's important to understand how deeply rooted this dynamic is. As has been observed of many oppressive institutions, the delegitimization of women's authority isn't the unfortunate side effect of a broken framework. It's grease that makes the entire system go. Women's erasure is an essential part of the deal powerful men have always made with the men they would have power over. Let me have control over you, and in turn, I will ensure you can control women. It's the same bargain white women make when they support white supremacist men in power. If I acquiesce to your demeaning me because of my gender, you will at least allow me to demean others because of their race. There is one meaningful way in which the fear mongers are right. Because the existing power structure is built on female subjugation, female credibility is inherently dangerous to it. So I'm just gonna leave that there as a little tease and turn it over to Bonnie and Sarah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. Um, when you reached out to me, I don't remember how long ago it was when this project began, um, but when you asked me about contributing to it, you know, the, the first person I thought of was that I wanted to work with Bonnie on this. And I didn't know if, you know, I think all the other pieces are solo authored. Um, and so I wasn't sure, oh, maybe, yeah, it is the only, no, there's a couple more. Okay, so, but I didn't know if you would would um, want to have um, of two authors on this piece, but you didn't even hesitate when I told you about Bonnie. And so Bonnie and I have worked together both, um, we both worked for the same organization um, for many years, but not necessarily in the same office. Um, and, um, and we had been really thinking hard about how to talk about some predators within our own tribal communities, um, some sort of superstar Native men that um, we were hearing horror stories about. And this opportunity um, came at that time when we were really struggling with that. So I immediately reached out to Bonnie um, and she said yes. And uh, we decided to dedicate this chapter to Bonnie's late mother. And I wanted to give Bonnie some space to talk about why we did that. I was contacted by Sarah and of course, you know, anytime I have a chance to talk about violence against women in particular, um, you know, I, I never want to say no. And um, for me, it's uh, again, part of my healing. It's part of my work as an advocate, part of my work as a, a grandmother, as a relative. Um, so it, absolutely, I jumped at the chance. Um, and it came at a time that was kind of um, weird for me. And we were getting ready for my mom's memorial. And, um, and a lot of the work that I do, you know, really, she was like my first teacher about how to be a good advocate. Um, my mom my mom, her, her name is Elizabeth Deer, her English name, and her Indian name was uh, Masha Nukanabenga, that means shining feather. And she, um, we're Ho-Chunk from the Ho-Chunk Nation. And in our tribe, we have clans. And my mother was from the warrior clan. And um, she had a lot of pride in that. She wore her clanship like a, uh, a badge of honor and you know and you know part of the part of our clanship really um, determines the kind of role we have within our nation so as from the warrior clan it's it's their responsibility to uh, fight sort of injustice and 
uh, go to battle against enemies and uh, back in the day. So she had relatives who did that. She had relatives who served in the war. And um, my mother's maiden name was Little Soldier, Elizabeth Little Soldier Deer. And um, she, like I said, wore her clanship like a badge of courage, badge of honor and was not afraid to speak out against any kind of injustice. She was uh, involved with the American Indian Movement. Um, a lot of the leaders in AIM, um, you know, they, they accomplished a lot of really good things despite some of their tactics, um, their, their political strategies, and um, even some of the sexism that existed in, in during that time. But my mom, you know, she knew exactly what they were working for and, and participated when she could. Um, but she, you know, she taught me about really the essence of advocacy, about standing up to injustice, speaking your mind, and knowing that when you do that, there's going to be backlash there's going to be people who don't agree with you, people who may even want to hurt you, harm you, uh, want to silence you. And, and that was sort of like, that was always sort of the tagline along with, you know, encouraging, encouraging that kind of um, uh, resistance. And, um, and she did that and, you know, just like it was just second nature, you know, whether it was, you know, standing up against uh, racism, no matter if it was, you know, overt racism uh, or, or covert racism, right? She caught it and she knew what it was and called it like it was. Um, so she was my inspiration for doing this work for the last 35 years or so. Um, and it's like second nature, right? When you, when you come from that kind of uh, background. So when Sarah suggested that we dedicate the, the essay to my mom, I was like, oh, you know, and just in the midst of getting ready for her memorial. Um, so I really want to say thank you for that. I don't know that I ever did, but thank you for um, that suggestion and, and doing that, um, wanting to do that. So I wanted to just say a little bit about my mom. Um, and, you know, I, I try to pass on some of that you know, that kind of teaching and inspiration to my own daughter, granddaughters, and even the younger, the younger people. And I, and I carry that in my heart to the young women that are coming into this work, into this movement, um, to, you know, to really carry on the, the resistance, carry on the ability to confront uh, injustice when it happens, and really to work to, um, you know, work work with one another as as peers, but also find your mentors, find those that are going to inspire you, but also just to just to know that there is that there is going to be backlash, right? Um, so I wanted to say that much about my mom. Um, and you know, one of the things like Sarah was saying, one of the things that um, we've been doing. And we've been calling it truth telling, um, you know, and anywhere I have the opportunity to, to do that, to engage in truth telling, you know, I, I, again, I grab at the opportunity because for me, it's really, um, it, it's so incredibly important. It, it, you know, giving that voice where we need to, um, you know, it's, it's really giving voice to people who were not able to do so. People, our ancestors that were silenced in boarding school, our ancestors that, you know, that died um, standing up for the truth. And all the women, uh, our children, our relatives who were raped, who were uh, murdered, um, and many of them are still uh, murdered and missing today. So you know, by, by engaging in truth telling, you know, it gives us an opportunity to not only voice our own opinions, but also really provide voice to those, to those that are voiceless today. So, um, and being able to participate in, in writing, co-writing the essay for me was, was part of that truth telling. So I don't know if, um, can I read a part of the essay? Okay, yay. Um, you know, and 
um, so much of what's been happening and then what was happening at the time when we were writing this essay is like, you know, it, it's like deja vu all over again, right? I, it made me think back to, you know, the 80s when I first started doing this work. And, you know, I, I came into this work terribly angry. Um, and I, I basically cut my teeth on the philosophies of people like Andrea Dorkin and Beth Ritchie and you know that that just sort of fed my spirit because I, I wanted to align what I was doing and why I was doing it with people who were out there being so vocal and you know that uh, that I, I needed that I needed that kind of energy so I even attended one of Andrea Dorkin's presentations and it felt like she was talking to me, you know, or, you know, voicing what I was feeling at the time. There was a, um, a serial rapist in our community in Minneapolis around that time when she came to Minneapolis. And I, I sort of happened on to uh, getting to hear her because I, I, I read her stuff and just I was like, you know, uh, she was like a superstar to me. And um, so I had a chance to go listen to her. And it was right in the midst of uh, a serial rapist that was targeting Native women who was murdering Native women in South Minneapolis, that a community that's high in uh, Native uh, population in the urban area. So, um, and a lot of those rapes and murders were happening right close to my office, um, right? Like if you were to put a pin on each of those locations where those women were found, um, you could put a pin right in, in the center of those, and that was my office. You know, so it, it kind of felt like, you know, after a while, it kind of felt like I was targeted because I was like out there a lot as well, talking about rape and, and why it happens and, you know, the impact of rape on, our, on, our, on ourselves as women, on, on our relatives, on our children. Um, so I had a chance to see her, and I just, I, I adored her. I loved her. Um, so writing this essay, co-writing it with Sarah, just kind of brought me back to some of that, some of those earlier days. And it's like, you know, on one hand, it's kind of like, wow, you know, we've come, we've come away since then. But some of what was being said and written about is still very much the same. You know, it feels like in, in some, on some particular days, it feels like not a whole lot has changed, right? But then there are other days where I feel like, yes, we've made progress. Laws are changing, um, you know, giving us back as Native people in our, you know, in our tribes, giving us back the, the authority to hold people accountable that come onto our lands. And, you know, and, and a lot of different really good legislation that's happening, you know, so you know that things are changing, but yet on a day-to-day -day basis, when you look at the kind of violence that's happening and why it's happening. It's like, you know, and not a lot has changed since the 80s, right? It's like my mom was visiting my office one day when we were in another location and she was looking around at all my books and all my binders and and she said, wow, you have a lot of information about, about what you're doing and the work you're doing. And she said, that's, that's really good. She said, um, and then she looked at me square in the face and said, so uh, what's your success rate? You know, because she knows I, I work on violence against women. And at the time she was working um, with um, some elders that were called clan mothers and they were working with um, adolescent girls that were having a lot of problems in their personal lives with with regard to rape and sexual abuse and sexual harassment and parents that were having some you know difficulties so the court um the juvenile court would refer these girls to the clan mothers to work with them about you know the problems they were facing that they were encountering and just with um the guidance and support and teaching these young women about you know values and you know empowering them um, these girls would go back to school and graduate and even go on to college. So they had a good success rate, right? So she was really proud of that as a clan mother. And this, my mom at that time was probably in her 80s or, 
So she was looking at me and she said, so what's your success rate? And at the time, you know, it was like, you know, violence against women was increasing. It was like out of, you know, just disproportionately high, especially for Native women. So I, I felt a little sheepish, like, well, you know, actually our numbers are kind of going up. And she was like, wow, what you got all these books about, you know, it should, you should be ending it by now, you know, so it's sort of like, you know, I kind of like shriveled up and like, oh, you're right, you're right. It, we should have conquered this problem by now. And, and she said, well, you know what the answer is? The answer is men just have to stop it. Men have to stop it. And that was her answer. And I said, yep, you're right, mom. Men just have to stop it. So I, you know, again, that was, that's another little story about my mom. Um, but she would, you know, they had, uh, I, we wrote a little bit about it in, in our essay. And I wanted to just to read a, a, a little bit from the essay talking about uh, truth telling and, and so forth. So there is no word for gossip in the Ho-Chunk language. Hinuk Wodak are stories, teachings, and personal accounts shared among women, girls, and women's circles about women's power, roles, and relationships. These stories often, often offer cautionary advice. Honiduk is a word that means to be talked about, but not always in the context meaning someone is doing wrong. It is left to the individual to decide how you want people to speak of you. Honey adic, honey adic is another word used to mean your actions will be discussed. Um, just as a side note, my Indian name is Rajadanga, which means to be called upon. And so it means to, um, to conduct yourself in a way that you'll be called upon to do good things or you'll be acknowledged for the good things you do in a public, in a public forum. Um, is another word used to mean your actions will be discussed. This talk is meant to shed light on someone who could pose a threat to others. The word is also used to encourage appropriate or heroic behavior to bring honor to one's clan, community, and nation. Let's stop calling it gossiping and start calling it truth telling. Of course, Native women across the hemisphere have been living in a Me Too world since long before cell phones and hashtags. From the first documented rape of a Native woman by a European man in 1495, our communities have struggled and suffered from widespread weaponized sexual violence intended to destroy our nations and deny our humanity. Yet we have survived. One of the main reasons that we have survived is our ability to share and circulate information about dangerous men. It's always a daunting task to write about Native people because they are often com conceptualized as a monolithic ethnicity, when in fact in the United States alone there are hundreds of indigenous cultures and languages that differ widely. Nonetheless, in our combined 50 plus years of advocating for Native survivors, of sexual assault, we have discovered some common themes that emerge for Native women in two-spirit, Native LGBTQ plus people who have been victimized by sexual abusers and predators. Native women suffer the highest rates of sexual violence in the nation, and our murder rate in some states is 10 times the rate of murder for other races. The federal government's own 2016 report concludes that more than four in five American Indian and Alaska Native women, 84.3% have experienced violence in their lifetime. Localized studies find that the rate is even higher among the two-spirit population. So this all means that statistically, the vast majority of Native women and two-spirit people expect to be victims of violent crime, usually more than once. It's sad to report that many Native mothers prepare their daughters for the inevitable, you will be a victim of sexual assault. It's only a matter of when. We are targets of sexual violence for many reasons. Racial hatred and stereotypes have emerged from a long history of mistreatment by mainstream society, leave us vulnerable to those who believe native bodies and spirits are subhuman. Internalized oppression and self-hatred results in violence within our homes and communities, complicated federal legal structures that prevent tribal nations from intervening Intervening in violence leave us vulnerable to continued abuse even when we attempt to report crimes. <clears throat> 
well, we have a long history of believing each other. Well, we, and we have a long history of believing each other. Well, Me Too is all about speaking out. We must also pay homage to our ancestors, including the women who learned to remain silent while our vi villages were being attacked. They protected themselves with silence so as not to be found and potentially raped and murdered or have their children raped and murdered. This tactic carried into boarding schools where Indian children suffered in silence to protect themselves, to not be found, to not be targeted as being vulnerable by the religious officials and teachers who abused, raped, and even murdered them. Boarding school survivors have shared that if they cried or fought back, it only resulted in more abuse and punishment, such as being thrown into isolation, as was done to prisoners of war. So children were learn to keep silent when they hid from the religious officials, knowing that if found in an isolated place, they would be molested and abused. Children learn that showing any outward signs of vulnerability only created more problems and more abuse, so they knew silence was key to protection, self-protection. So, you know, just within that kind of history, you know, the from the 80s where I was this angry um, survivor, of uh, all sorts of abuse, um, you know, it really compelled me to, like I said, sort of align my advocacy work with people like Andrea Dworkin and others from Minnesota that really inspired the, the women's movement here. But I, t I started to really reach out and listen to a lot of my elders and really listen to, you know, the roots of our own history with regard to the historic trauma and really started to pay more attention to some of the men around me, even like, you know, my own men relatives who many of them fought in um, wars, different wars who came back as, you know, decorated heroes, but yet these men were very gentle. You know, they were very gentle um, in their, their personalities. They were very respectful. They, um, you know, were in long-term relationships with their partners, they raised families, they were hard workers. Um, and, you know, it really started to sort of, as it put it in a whole different context for me of where does this violence come from then? Um, because it's like a lot of the men that I was seeing when I really took time to look and pay attention were really very equal, you know, practiced equality on a on a day-to-day -day basis right in their roles they weren't ashamed to you know pick up that mop or do those dishes or wash those clothes um and so i started to really look at you know how how can i utilize my advocacy and also my my knowledge about where we come from as native people to really reframe you know advocacy to still, you know, not disregard the importance of what my mom taught me uh, about standing up to injustice um, and to be that truth teller, because that still works for me. And I have to put it in a context that, you know, people will will listen. Um, and it's it's we're doing it. You know, it's it's working. Um, and by, by the time I say that, something will happen and people will just, somebody will just crush that, you know, and I'll hear about something on social media, but it's okay, you know, because we have the ability to continue that work of truth telling. And I want to say more about that later, but I want to give Sarah a chance. Um, so I'm going to say that much for now. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, God, I miss you. <laughs> used to, we used to work in the same office. It's been years. Um, I think one of the things that I felt we needed to do with this essay is address Native perpetrators. Um, one of the things, if you know anything about me, you know I do a lot of work on the Violence Against Women Act and congressional legislation and some of those kinds of things. And we have this statistic comes from the federal government that most of our perps are white. Um, and that's really unusual. Most of the time, rape and other kinds of interpersonal crime are, are intra-racial, right? Um, but we're the only exception to that. And so I found that there was, a, there was an easy sort of avenue to hook in a legislator to say, don't you know that most of the perpetrators statistically against Native women are, are white? And that would get their attention, right? That, oh, well, this is, this is serious. They're being targeted, right? And in, in doing that and in raising those statistics and talking to legislators and writing articles and whatnot, I felt like 
in a way were we letting native men off the hook, right? Because yes, the statistics are accurate, but that doesn't mean there's not native perpetrators. And one of the things that we started to see, Bonnie and I, as young women from the Twin Cities areas could come to us when they knew that we could, they could trust us, was hearing about some of these, you know, very well-regarded, powerful, young native men who were using their power and control against young women, white women and native women. And one in particular was affiliated with a very, very high profile native woman in Minnesota and he spoke the language and he rode horses and he gave Indian names and he also was molesting girls and boys and it was very hard to figure out what to do with that information we tried sharing it in a variety of forums um, and and it just wasn't people didn't want to hear it you know because he's such a good guy he knows his language and he doesn't drink therefore you know he's safe and and um, and so you'll see that in the chapter we don't name him but we we talk about how difficult that is when we're trying to, um, you know, it's one thing to say it's the white man's problem, they're doing this to us, but then to kind of look inward and say we have to hold our own people accountable. Um, Bonnie's been doing that forever, um, but, um, but this particular man is continuing, you know, to, to victimize people. Unfortunately, we were just not, not able to put his name down um, because there's no quote unquote proof, but we know he did it. So, um, so that's another thing that inspired the chapter. Thank you both so much. If you want to say more, Sarah, you have a few more minutes. Um, oh. <laughs> otherwise we can. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think one of the things I, I'm starting to learn my language and the Creek language or Muscogee, um, which is the tribe I'm from in Oklahoma. Um, and so I, um, I wanted to know if we had a word for gossip. You know, I'd gone and looked to see, you know, when I got the dictionary and I first started learning the language, I wanted to see like words like rape and abuse and marriage and divorce and custody. And, you know, our, our, our language doesn't have a lot of those words. There's not a direct translation. Um, but I couldn't find a word for gossip. And I felt like that's what Bonnie and I were being accused of as we were helping navigate uh, some of these young people and some of the victim's parents who were trying to speak out about this particular native perpetrator um, and the those words get used a lot against women that you're just gossiping you're stirring up trouble um, you know um, yeah you're the, the, the gossip is, is, a, is a is a sexist it's deployed in a very sexist way and so I thought what if we turn to our own language and found how we talk about how we talk about people. And so that's what we did. And the phrase in um, the phrase, there's not a word for gossip, but the phrase that comes closest to it is isti obanachka iskagidos. And it doesn't have negative connotations. It means people talking about people. Um, and it's largely women's talk and it's largely done in sort of gender segregation. Some of our ceremonies have very separate roles for genders. And so it's when women are alone and they're doing this kind of talk and it's a productive talk and it's a, it's a, it's a, tenant to the community. It's a safe thing to do for the community to make sure we all know what's going on. And it doesn't have that mm, gossip um, sort of connection. So I thought that would be an important thing to use our own language to talk about, you know, we, we, we get stuck in one language. We only think of it in one way, but when you bring in another language, whether it's an indigenous language or a foreign language of, of another kind, we learn more about what it is that we do and think. So I felt it was important to start with that language is culture, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they say. <laughs> well, we, um, I think I'm going to ask people to go ahead and start sharing their Q&As, uh, their Q&As, their Q's, our A's, right? Um, questions in our Q&A box there, because we want to have um, plenty of time to hear what people, you know, want to hear from, from you three. Um, so while people are typing those in, um, I just want to thank you both again for speaking so powerfully about this topic and um, for that essay and it's just, I'm a little bit lost for words. Um, I'm going to ask you a question uh, while we're waiting again for people to type in there. Um, and that's about representation and what people that are in roles like the role of the Rockwell Museum or of the fiction authors that have books in card carrying, books and gifts. Um, so, you know, we're a partner here, the Rockwell Museum tonight, 
because our mission is to actively respond to this underrepresentation of women and of black and indigenous and people of color um, when we look around at our world, the art world. And tonight we're talking about this importance of believing and trusting women and finding women important. And if I open not this art history book, but most of my other ones, I will not find a lot of women in there. Um, so I'm wondering if you all can speak to the role that representation has in spaces like art and media and what that plays in this conversation about believing women and finding women important. All right, I'll tell a story. This is a story I always tell for the representation question. So apologize to people who've heard me tell this story before, but I really feel like it, it tells the whole story. I grew up by accident of geography uh, in the congregation of the first woman ordained as a rabbi in the modern era. Her name is Sally Presam. She's amazing. Uh, and I, you know, as kids, we didn't know any different. And there was actually a, a female cantor on stage as well, who's the other worship leader in, in Jewish tradition. And so we, you know, we just saw that's what temple was like. And one night after temple, the younger brother of a friend of mine from the temple asked his mother, can men be rabbis? Right? Because he didn't see any men up there and he didn't know if it was possible. And I just, that story, it's so transformative. You know, representation isn't everything. You know, when we talk about like, we need more women leaders. Well, it matters what kind of women leaders they are, right? Like Betsy DeVos, I could live without, right? Um, uh, but representation really does matter because what we can see plays an enormous role in what we can imagine. There are rare people like Rabbi Prezand who were able to imagine themselves into a role that no one ever showed them was possible. But for, for most of us, it, it's so much more, our lives are so much more full of possibility when we see what we can be. Uh, and it, it just has so much of an impact on the imagination. Well, we're pretty native women. There's not, we're, we're pretty, um, you know, small population. And so we get left off of a lot of studies and statistics, you know. Um, I, I couldn't find crime data that dealt with Native women until I was done with law school, you know, because we're always in the other category. And um, so representation matters, you know, it's, it's, it's when I became a law professor um, back in uh, 2008, I think, um, there were, oh, there were less than 10 Native women law professors, right? And so, you know, you could go to law school, you could become a, a practicing attorney and not ever be exposed to anything related to Indian law or otherwise. And um, that can be a, a big mistake for a young attorney. So there's still not very many of us. I think it might be 12 now. But, um, but yeah, and I didn't know any, I really didn't know any Native women attorneys when I started law school. My father was a state court judge, so I knew that Indians could be judges, but but more generally in the practice of law, I didn't see very many Native people at all. Um, so that matters. Um, it just for me, it just brings up the whole notion, and it's a it's a big it's a big piece of what I've been thinking about is just how how we share space, um, and you know and even with social media, and I'm going to go off on that, on that piece a little bit, um, you know, when, when people disclose to us, when women disclose to us that they've been raped by a particular person, and we know, or we know of perpetrators, and, you know, go, go sort of snooping around about who, who, who's friends with this perpetrator. Um, so it does, it just, this doesn't relate to your question much, but it just got me thinking about sharing space, and, someone talked to me about that, about sharing space and being in the same, and like being in that same place as a perpetrator and what they're doing versus maybe boycotting that person, boycotting that perpetrator. So, you know, and the whole notion about sharing space even, it's like, you know, if you're gonna be Facebook friends with that person, what does that mean? You're sharing that space with that person. You're aligning yourself with that person. You're colluding with that person. So, you know, just, it, it got me thinking about that, the whole notion of sharing space. Um, you know, oftentimes we are, we are so invisible because, you know, we, there's, for one reason or another, maybe it's because of the silence, the cultural silence yet that still exists, but 
you know, any opportunity that we have, you know, I think we, it's important for us to, to have that, that those opportunities presented to us and also for us to, to take them when it's safe to do so. Um, you know, and oftentimes I, I think about my mom because like she said, you know, anytime you, you do this, you confront injustice and you work to change that, there's going to be, you, you will likely experience um, backlash. So I just, it, it made me think about the notion of sharing space. I think that that's such a perfect way to frame the idea of representation as like sharing space. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, museums are definitely experiencing a lot of backlash right now, rightfully so, because for so long, you know, art spaces refuse to share space with people who weren't what you think of as the genius artist, which means Jackson Pollock, a white man. Anyhow, don't get me started. But <laughs> yeah, so in any realm, you know, whether it's religion, you know, a lot like your career aspirations, even if you're thinking about just who, you, who your circle is, representation is really important. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at my other questions. Let's see. Let's see what I want to do first. I'm going to relate them to each other. Um, a question for Sarah um, is something that you just touched on a little bit in your answer, that the idea that um, this is from one of our friends on the Native American Council at Corning Incorporated. She's asking, you know, as um, Native American individuals are lumped in with other e ethnic minorities, and so does that make your work more challenging when you're looking for that data? Yes, I, I, I'm not a statistician. I can barely add. I tried to do fractions the other day when I was sewing, and it was a very sad situation. So I need to audit a third grade math class um, so that I can sew. But I do use statistics a lot in my work, and they're helpful in briefs, they're helpful in legal arguments, they're helpful in lobbying. And to have, be able to, to show a, a lawmaker, look, 84% of Native women have been assaulted. That is a federal data point. It's not created by some radical, mad Native women. You know, this is the federal data. Um, and it's hard to come by because, because we're such a small population, we don't make up the statistically significant sample in most of, and again, I'm using all these terms that have very technical meanings, but we're not sampled widely enough. And when you, when you do that, then you don't really get at the story of the most marginalized. You know, the, the most marginalized stories don't get told, they're lumped with other marginalized stories to become basically one non -mar one marginalized data point. And so it's been really important to impress upon uh, people who study crime and people who study statistics to make sure there's ways that we can be counted. Thank you. Um, I have another question that's a little bit relevant and we don't, you know, we're not going to spend the rest of our time um, talking about crime statistics, but um, just while we're, while we're on the topic. Um, you know, we use the term Indian country, which is like a, um, uh, like an affectionate term that, um, a lot of Native people use, but it's also a demeaning term that the military uses. Oh, actually, no. <laughs> Indian, yeah. Indian country is not a demeaning term. No, when, um, the, the military uses when they're in, um, overseas, talking about enemy territory. Oh, enemy territory. Yeah. Okay. It's an affectionate term for, right? And it's a established term in the culture, but um, it can be used in that derogatory way. And then the, so the FBI has a branch called Indian Country Crime that's dedicated to protecting tribal communities. So do you think that that's the, you know, the appropriate name for that FBI's unit? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it sounds a lot, I think people have been kind of trained not to say Indian. Right. Um, Right, right. And you asked 10 different Native people, there are going to be 15 different answers on that. Right. But Indian country is actually a legal term of art that's used in federal codes and federal cases. So as an attorney, I use it all the time. It's not demeaning. Right. So you are the right person to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, you might people disagree with me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, that's it. You're the authority. Um, thank you. Um, this is a very interesting question uh, that maybe might be more for Jacqueline, um, the response to Believe Me to the book, um, what has the response been? And do you, are you starting to gather that there are people who are not engaging with this content that you wish would? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the response has been amazing. I, I, it kind of fell off dramatically when COVID times hit because 
it's not exactly a light read. And I think a lot of people are looking for escapist reads right now. Um, but before that, the book came out in January and we, I did get the opportunity to tour around quite a bit and talk to people about the book. And people just, I mean, the response is overwhelming because there's a huge hunger for this, right? That most women really just deeply get what this book is about. But then, um, you know, there's the, the discourse most recently that I was part of about the allegations against Joe Biden from Tara Reid. Um, but you see this literally any time there are sexual assault allegations about anybody is immediately someone will turn it into, oh, I thought, you know, if you're gonna believe all women, no matter whatever they say, right? Which is, it's a bad faith sleight of hand that people do when they wanna discredit the idea of treating women's allegations and women in general as credible and, and important. And, and so the people who, are, I, I just wanna shove this book into everybody's hands, whoever says, I thought you meant believe all women. I thought we we're supposed to, are we supposed to believe all women? Um, and as though it's a ridiculous proposition. And so those are the people who I think are, are most missing the mark and who I just literally want to like, I don't know if forced reading is something. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't really want to do it because if I think about it too hard, that's violence. But like, there is the, the gut impulse to be like, literally, please just read this book and shut up until you do. Um, because it's, it's so bad faith when you see it. And I just want everyone listening to see, to, look, to take a look for the difference between believe women, which is about treating women as credible and important until proven otherwise, and believe all women all the time. And when you see people arguing the latter to discredit the former proposition, call them out, call them out. Um, because our, our lives are literally depending on this. I mean, my essay is all about the costs of not believing women. Because we talk so much about, oh, well, if we were to make the change you're proposing, like, so, it would, there'd be so many things that would have to change, right? There'd be so many costs. But, you know, my, my essay opens talking about mass gun violence, right? And how many perpetrators of mass gun violence have a history of abusing a woman or women in their lives. And if we took those women's lives as credible and important, maybe we wouldn't let those people have guns. And all of the people who are victims of mass gun violence would be alive, right? So it's, you don't have to be the woman who is being disbelieved to be impacted by the disbelief of women. And, um, and I wish people really understood that. Thank you. That's a great answer. <laughs> I will tell everyone that when I'm talking about the book. I'll say, here's a specifically who it's for. If you know anybody like that, just sit and watch them read it. But yeah, we just have such a tendency to go to these extremes and it's just like, just stop and think, please. Um, okay, I have a question that's specifically for Bonnie, but you know, I think everyone could answer this. I think we just were so moved by hearing about your work and um, your background. So the question is, you know, finding the strength to stand up for what's right if you're the only woman or the only minority or the only woman and minority in the room, where do you find the courage to do that? How do you, what are some techniques? And they specifically, the asker is saying, asking if your mom had advice for that, because it sounds like your mom had advice for just about anything, Bonnie. You know, it, it it's sort of a, um, um, uh, for me, it's part of my clan duties. Um, I'm from the Bear Clan, and our role within our nation is uh, being a peacekeeper. Um, and we're also sort of like the cops of the tribe. Um, so, so part of my inspiration is is knowing that I have to fulfill that responsibility um, of my clan. Um, but really it, it, you know, everything that I've done is really, I, I have, you know, the, you know, the, the faces of the women that I've worked with, um, the, the stories, the, um, the accounts, I, I hate to call them stories, you know, um, the accounts of what happened to them um, in regard to, you know, the sexual violence, the domestic violence, um, I carry that with me all the time, all the time since I started this work. And it's just, it's, it's sort of ingrained in me. Um, 
and it sounds, I don't know, maybe it sounds sort of, I don't know, cliche, or I don't know how, what you want to call it, but really it is. It really, it's really what inspires me. And it's women from all, all facets of this continent, right? Young and old, uh, incarcerated women, um, older women, um, you know, adolescents. So I, I carry their their uh, accounts. I carry their, many of them weren't able to find justice. Um, and, you know, I, I have this uh, story that happened about, you know, healing. Our, as Native people, we're all about healing, right, with our ceremonies and um, all of those things that we have available to us, which we're blessed to have, right? But, um, you know, I, I started hearing more and more about healing and there's groups of uh, individuals who really focus a lot, on, a lot on our healing, especially from alcohol and drug abuse and all of the things that happen because of alcohol and drug abuse, right? Um, and they kind of lump in violence in that category that, that sort of was a little unnerving to me. Um, just because I think that's not really the, the primary reason why violence against women happens. So even that was another sort of like another thing that just made me angry. Right? <laughs> um, but um, so it's like I got to that point where I was like, can you know what, we, can we really heal if we don't have justice? And what does that mean? So I had a, a, a big conversation. I visited with a, a friend of mine who's passed. Her name was Ellen Pence. And we were talking, she was asking me about healing and what is that, what does that look like? What does that mean? How do we know when we're healed? How do we, how do we do that? And, um, and then we got into the whole discussion about it. And I, and I, I told her that I said, you know, I don't, I don't think we can, we can adequately heal unless we have a sense of justice. And we, we talk about that in the essay, um, that, you know, and injustice can come in many forms, but she said, you know what, that reminds me of Desmond Tutu, um, that there, he said that um, there's three things that need to happen um, that, you know, when, when violence happens, there needs to be uh, truth telling, the truth has to be told, right? Um, and the harm has to be repaired, the harm that was caused by the violence has to be repaired. And the reason why it happened has to be uh, eradicated, has, it has to be um, repaired, has to be fixed, has to be addressed. So we had a, a big conversation about that as well. And that again, that inspires my work, that inspires me. You know, when I'm, I'm sort of nearing, um, talked about and thought about retirement, but you know, all throughout, that's that's really what inspires me, along with my mom, who keeps, you know, I keep hearing her her message and her voice in my head. It's like, you know, you got to do this. That's not right. You got to do this. You have to speak out. You have to write that letter. You have to send that email. Um, so that's again, that's where that's where my inspiration comes from, and the courage to do it. You know, I think about the courage it took for all these people who were able to survive and, and their family members of those who were murdered and are missing and the courage they have to continue to address the injustice, to keep looking for their relative who's missing. And it's like, you know, it, it doesn't really take that much courage like they have. So that also inspires my work. Thank you. Anyone else want to add on to that one? I would just say that I've been doing a lot of thinking about this and, ex and emotional exploring about this this year because I found myself really starting to get beaten down and starting to not speak up and be like, well, nothing's going to change, you know, which is not temperamentally how I've lived my life. And there have just been several moments and the most recent one has been watching AOC's speech on, on Congress floor uh, about uh, having been called a name I'm not going to repeat uh, by fellow congressmen uh, and how, and just sort of how the dignity of refusing to accept the unacceptable. And I try to be inspired by watching people do this and, and to overcome my 
exhaustion and cynicism which has been setting in. And, and I had an opportunity, which is, you know, both a blessing and a curse to, to practice this recently. I won't tell you the story because you don't need to hear it. But, um, and it's really, it's really fucking liberating, right? Like, it's actually really liberating to tell yourself to do in practice that the belief that your dignity and your freedom is more important than other people's opinions of you. Now, I'm not saying there's not backlash and I don't think we have time to get into a conversation about backlash. I don't wanna undermine the fact that it comes with real risk. Um, but it is, it's really freeing when you manage to do it. It's really freeing. I'm going to give Sarah a chance if she wants to speak as well. But yeah, I, I think that AOC, she just continues to exceed my expectations. But I think that came at a really good moment for a lot of us. Where we were yeah, like, we needed yeah. that win right now. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a it was really inspiring. Um, I mean, I just um, I don't know. I just like to hear Bonnie talk more. But <laughs> um, I just love the binder stories. And every once in a while, I just think about her mom looking at all those like training manuals on domestic violence and going, just tell men to stop. Um, and it's just such a wonderful story and image in my head. I, I got, I had a chance to know um, Bonnie's mom in the last years of her life. She was the one I, after I finished treatment for breast cancer and I was still wearing a, a wig, um, she felt under it and she said, you have hair on there, take that off. You know, so she was just somebody that you can remember and, and think um, about how she stood up and went to Alcatraz, you know, did all the, did all the things. Um, and and then kind of bank on that as an inspiration in times that are tough. So thank you, Bonnie, for that. Thank you all, and thank you for that question, because it is, I don't know, I think sometimes we can feel that way of just like, well, you know, everyone has been so much braver than me, but um, you still have to remind yourself where it is that you draw that strength from, so thank yeah. you. Um, I think this might be my last question question. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. If it's a short answer, then <laughs> we'll have a couple more. Um, so without further ado, um, this is a, a great question, something people think about a lot. What recommendations do you have for, in this case, queer white women, but I would ask this also myself as a straight white woman, to support and advocate for Native women and two-spirit folks bodily autonomy and rights without falling into that trap of speaking for anybody, speaking for Native folks, um, or in the tricky situation of, you know, if you're confronted with a situation, if you're calling out a perpetrator, if that perpetrator is a, na a Native person or a, another intersecting person of color. So how to, you know, call out without falling into the trap of speaking for in that balance? I mean, just cultivate, oh, my, can you hear me? Oh, um, cultivate spaces for 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 people to talk. Um, you know, create create instances like this where we have two Native women on this call um, talking about Native issues. You know, just cultivate that space. Um, and you'll make mistakes when you like. If I advocate for a Black woman and I make a stupid mistake out of my ignorance, um, it happens. And and if you you know if you don't do anything, you're not going to be any help. So. It, it's important to be able to make mistakes in some ways, but to be to be thoughtful about that and to take criticism, um, but mostly just allowing those communities to speak on their own terms is the best, always the best course of action in my experience. As a white woman, I would add, uh, learn to be a good follower. Like listen to native women saying what they need and want and do that stuff. Right, just do something <laughs> right just get involved okay that was a pretty short answer let's ask one more question which is um i think this is going to be the exact same answer but a few people have asked you know is there a call to action here tonight um are there things that that we all can do is there you know maybe one or two things that each of you want to share with anybody who's here tonight as as a call to action um, you know, I was, I, I would say the Violence Against Women Act is stuck right now in Congress. We have a Republican version and we have a Democratic version. Um, and, and there's a lot in that, the, that bill that, that does, that improves things for Native women. 
At the same time, though, I think there has been valid and critical pushback about VAWA and its focus on law and order and criminal justice in this age of mass incarceration. So I, I work for VAWA because it is the avenue through which we've been able to make achievements as Native women to fund and support violent, you know, the issues of, that face women victims of violence in tribal communities. Um, but we also need to be, you know, critical about it at the same time. I think women of color have raised valid concerns about its focus on arrest and incarceration um, uh, when compared to other possible community solutions to these challenges. So I don't want to say go work for VAWA because I don't think it's something everybody wants to do for good reason. Um, so I won't say that. I'll just say I'm going to be working on VAWA. If you want to know more, um, look me up. Hi, Bonnie, any, any one or two things that you would ask us to do as a call to action? It's, I'm, I'm in just in a weird place. Um, you know, I don't know because of just because of what's happening in our country and um, some of the, um, the the impact or the effects of COVID and um, not being able to um, celebrate, you know, culturally in our gatherings, all of that. So I'm, I'm just in a weird place. But um, again, I'm really thankful that we've had this opportunity and that you've, um, Jacqueline has um, shared this space with us. Um, you know, one, one of the things that just, that, that keeps going through my mind with this, and it, and it again, it, it helps me, um, is really celebrating our, you know, our, um, our humanity and, you know, working together and, um, I was doing I was doing some reading and I I came upon this looking sorting through files and I was going to look for it but there was a a cartoon way back in the 80s and it was a cartoon of Ronald Reagan and he had um he had a holster on with some with uh, big guns in it and um the caption said Mer make America a man again um and I it was kind of um coincidentally that you know, I was getting ready for this and just kind of clearing out some things here at the office. Um, and, you know, again, you know, my mom would always say, you know, if something angers you, then do something about it. Um, and it just was, it kind of like came together as far as, you know, doing this, this piece for you all. And, um, and even this writing the essay and all of the different uh, opportunities that that I've had, it's like all of those bits and pieces really do matter when you put them together. Um, that that's, you know, on all of our parts is really action, you know, and it's um, creating change and it's, you know, uh, giving us opportunity to listen and visit about what those things that concern us, you know, that, that I've been doing for like 30 years. Um, and it and it does create change. Um, I have to keep reminding myself of that. But it's like those words reminded me of like the, the Make America Great Again. I, I came across that cartoon. It was like, oh my God, you know, that's like in the 80s. So um, it's so it's so critically important that we continue the work that we're doing to to just um, confront all the different forms of oppression that contribute to the violence that happens. You know, that's that's really my bottom line. It's like wherever it happens, whether it's covertly or overtly, and it's it's like on a daily basis for me, you know, and you pick and choose, but you know, we, we have to continue the fight. We really do. It's so critically important right now. And the one way that I say I can do that and I tell my family, my relatives, everyone is to vote. So yeah, that's the is that was that gonna be yours, Jeff? That's that's mine. <laughs> I mean, that's my, my absolute number one. I would, I would just underline what I said about it's cool to be a follower. Movements need followers. You don't have to invent something new. Whatever issue you care about, there are probably other people working on it and leading on it. And they need your money and they need your time and they need your talents. Whatever talents and money and time you have available can be put to use on an issue you care about. Just get in touch with the people who are already leading and then 
find your edge, right? Do give more of your money, time, and or talents than is, than is strictly comfortable. Um, and, and that's, I think that's where the sweet spot is, but absolutely number one is vote. That's great. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I can't believe I got to be a part of this. It's dusty. Okay, thank you so much. And, and thanks to our guests and panelists again. Um, nice to see all of you and, and sort of meet you. This has been amazing to listen to. Um, my wife and our good friend years ago started card carrying uh, because they wanted to have a place where voices of women, people of color, LGBTQ people had a voice, um, put the, make, make those voices amplified. And so creating spaces for conversations like this is, is what we're all about. And we're so grateful to the Rockwell Museum for um, their support of this event and to all of you for making time in your schedules to come and have this conversation with us. Um, I just wanna mention that um, people who are on the, on the call tonight and, and here joining us can check out more information about other events that Card Caring is hosting. We have several happening just this month in August. So please follow Card Caring Shop on Facebook and Instagram for more information on those. And um, the book, believe me, we just got a new order of that because it sold really well for us. So um, we have that available. You can purchase it on our website and you can also stop in and pick up a copy. Um, and we also have some really awesome buttons that Jacqueline provided that we are gonna give to you if you get your copy. Um, they're fantastic. They look just like that one. <laughs> so again, thanks to all of you. We so appreciate it. Thank you so much. And when you buy your book, don't forget to buy more post-it notes. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much. Have a great night. <laughs>